I just got back from cutting down some trees in my driveway. Very slow going. Hopped in the shower to get all the grime off. Cutting down trees is grimy, by the way, if you haven't done it. <clears throat> sort of thinking about how the agile movement in software, although it's not agile's fault, agile just was what caught on. It could have been any other ridiculous, unworkable management strategies. Mirrors exactly what came in the culture. Now, we can argue about which came first. Uh, I don't really care. But I, I'm showing by way of contrast, like here's an industry, here's what's happening in society. They're, they're the same, right? They're just the same thing. Different stuff, right? So when you <clears throat> talk about something that happens in, say, uh, the management of a corporation that, or, or a part of a corporation that's building software and the management of a country, like a government, yeah, there's different pieces and, and different shapes and whatnot, right? But there's a mirror, right? It's, so what's happening is the same, even though it looks a little bit different because you can't implement the same things in a small software team as you can in a, a relatively large government, for example. Uh, you're also dealing with different moving parts and more moving parts, right? <coughs> so I've talked about rapid application development before, and you know the rad movement was to build prototypes while you were building the real thing, like parallel development. There's two languages, one for the rad to get the GUI right, to get the workflow right, to test out that the users and developers are on the same thing, right? And then developers developing hopefully a real language like C or, you know, nowadays Go or, or maybe Rust or hopefully not Haskell, lots of bugs. Um, <clears throat> that didn't happen. Instead, it collapsed, right? And so speed of release, that's important. Um, I don't know why, uh, you know, but like with everything, when you when you rush through, you don't get a good quality result. And that's why you need more releases, right? Because you just release garbage to the customers. And apparently no one cares if you release garbage to customers and they're unhappy because just release again. Uh, but when you take time to architect the software, uh, then you need fewer releases. You don't need stressful run, run, run release schedules, right? And while you can automate your release, and look, I, that's what I did for a living. I automated releases. Like that's literally what I did. You know, I was doing DevOps before they called it DevOps. This, this isn't hard. Um, you can do that. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with having it automated, right? Uh, but also, releases should be rare and expensive because that's what your customers see. <clears throat> you want to make sure things are tested first, not tested by them. Uh, you know, at some point, with what's uh, it's already happened to some extent, right here and there, but it, it's going to get more widespread. Customers are going to be like, "I'm doing your testing. You need to pay me." Yeah, right. This is like the argument at the grocery store. Uh, I didn't come here to bag my groceries. I came here to pay you to bag my groceries. Yeah, they kind of did. You know, I mean, you can fall down either way on it, but it's not like they don't have a point, right? You know, oh, there's self checkout. Yeah, if you're in a hurry, or you're antisocial. <clears throat> that might be me. Um, then maybe you use self-checkout, although I, I don't use self-checkout as often anymore. Um, fair enough. Uh, you know, and maybe they should charge extra for self-checkout because it's a convenience. And maybe someday they will. They did that with uh, automatic teller machines, right? They used to be free. Uh, and now ATMs are pay machines, right? Uh, even at some banks, uh, even for their own, you know, uh, banking banking clients, it's it's ridiculous. The move in software has been less competence, less time taken, more parasitic, right? I mean, ooh, we slap together all this stuff in no time because we're using other people's codes. You know, we're using millions of lines of code that we didn't write. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but boy, you should know what that code is good for and what it's not. If you don't know what something's not good at, you shouldn't use it as a tool ever, right? And the problem is we've given people these tools, right? And it's much like giving a child a chainsaw. And sure, they're going to cut off a limb and then the cybersecurity guys and the DevOps people are going to come back in and sew the limb on, but it's not the same limb, guys. It's never going to be as good, 
It's, oh, we can put in a bionic. You're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. We can refactor that maybe you can. Maybe you can't. Maybe the fact that you didn't architect it in the first place means you're not qualified to refactor it either. I've seen that happen. You know, and with unit testing, which is the scourge of development, absolute worst. If those are the mistakes you're making, you need to like, would you like fries with that job first and kind of work your way up? I mean, seriously. Uh, I've said this before, unit tasks were designed for private functions and large teams where you didn't have access to the other person's source code. We live in the age of Git now, guys. Like that never happens, ever. Like, it's not a thing. You don't need that, right? And that was to protect you from the other person screwing up. It wasn't to help you with your code, never. Not that it didn't have that side effect, but it was to give the other person confidence that your code worked. I'm using it backwards. And then again, when you test bottom up, you're not integration testing. If you test integration, all the bottom up stuff will also fall out of that tests. So why would you do two sets of tests when you can just do one that's better, right? You do runtime in integrated runtime testing right? and you test late in the cycle because then you find out which developers you have are any good at all and which aren't and what skills to give them. Like, what do they need to know to not make these mistakes? Well, first I need to know what mistakes they're making. And if they're hiding their architectural errors by passing unit tests, which I've seen so many times is not even funny, I don't know what they need to skill up on. I can't make them better engineers. Why do I have a business? And you can get cynical about, oh, most businesses are just in business to make money. That's wrong. That's so wrong, it's ridiculous. I had a four year spat where I was out there saying, look, I can save you 40% on AWS. And I can, I can save probably any company 40% on AWS. There's just some exceptions. Some people use it really well. No one cares. No one cares. No one, no company wants to save 40% on AWS. It's not interesting. I mean, it's sort of changing now, right? But uh, they're usually doing their own internal measures instead of doing something really intelligent, like an overview look at how you're using cloud and how efficient your architecture is. Because the, the number one determining factor is usage. The number two determining factor, not far behind it, is architecture, right? It's, it's very tricky. I think I have talked about this before. There was a thing on serverless, on uh, Lambda functions, back in a you know, while ago. And he's talking about Python versus Java and the way you organize and sequence your Java code makes a huge difference in how much your Lambda function costs to run on AWS. And it was one of these, I'm, I'm a performance geek. Like I love computer performance in particular, love it. And so I was, I was just chewing this up. I'm like, oh yeah, you get the hot zone and the warm zone and you know, in Java and like, oh yeah, if you load it this, if you write the function this way, it loads in this order on this time scale so that when the Lambda function fires up, right? And when your subsequent calls and versus new calls, right? And all that. I mean, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, fascinating uh, presentation. I don't know if it, how well it still applies because they, they have changed Lambda since then. But that architectural decision on how you format your job, which lines go in which, not the functionality. That didn't change at all. No, I don't even think the number of lines of code changed. A few, few more characters to make it uh, faster, actually, which is counterintuitive. Um, which order you put those five, I think it was a five line code example, makes a whopping like 40% difference in the speed of your Lambda function, right? And speed in function execution uh, equals uh, lower latency and, and better scaling because all lower latency uh, equals better scaling, right? Because the, the quicker you can get the data that your load's going up and the more linearly your load goes up or the more predictably actually, Linearly is better, but predictable is, 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 is predictable is more important. But the more predictable your, your, uh, your load goes up, the better able you are to scale your application before it hits the load point. And so you can do your horizontal scaling trick, right? And, and that's really important. And a lot of people miss that. 
and those are the sorts of things that get missed, like cutting your own arm off and having to sew it back on, right? I mean, you're giving people access to big tools. And this is the problem with so-called uh, 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 new programming languages is Rust is great, but if you don't understand those optimizations and why they were written and how to use them, uh, and I know Primogen, the Primogen talks about this a lot, like you, it's a skill issue, right? I mean, to some extent, I, some of it's just, you're never gonna be able to understand this issue because a lot of it's very high level, but you shouldn't be using that stuff because it won't be faster. It'll be slower. And the, the one thing he was, this guy had written a trading algorithm, I think at Python, and he transferred it to Rust and it was slower. And it's like, well, yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, it's not gonna be faster. All these programming languages are written in C. <clears throat> that might be a hint that you can do all of that in C. Uh, that's what I would do. Uh, and optimized assembly, because I used to do C and optimized assembly. Although I'm not I'm not a great assembly language programmer. I haven't done it in years. I can still read assembly kind of, you know, but, I, you know, I never need to. Um, and I have done it in the past five years. I've looked at assembly code and go, oh, I see. Yeah, that's okay. You know, but... Uh, it, it, you know, it's a skill I can pick back up. I mean, I don't know that I want to, but I could. And and that's the problem. If you don't know what's going on at the bottom uh, level, I think I've talked about this before too. There was a Quora article out there. Somebody asked, how do people write Nintendo games in, I forget what Nintendo cartridges are, 8K or something like Mario Brothers, it was a specific game. And this one guy broke it all down. And like, he actually happened to know the, I don't know if he worked on the team or whatever. Like he knew, like, oh, they stuffed the bits for these things here. And then they had extra bits here and they do an overread on this. And then they cut that variable up and read the first, you know, they do all this nonsense to fit these things, or they used to, to fit these things on these little 8K and 16K cartridges. And they get a tremendous amount of data out of it. We can't do that now. We can't do that with Rust. You can't do that with these modern tools, right? Uh, they're not optimized for space. They're not optimized for memory space. They're not optimized for speed of access. They're not optimized for this. Speed of access gets tricky once you start. Like if you ever dig into caches, especially CPU caches, and the impact that your code design has on CPU caches, oh, I mean, that gets nasty fast. Um, that's the sort of stuff I eat up. I love it. Uh, but pff, what a bear. And you're, you're not going to manipulate that as easily in Rust, right? I mean, you can do it better in C, obviously, but you have to be a good C programmer. You can shoot yourself in the foot in C. Yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot with Rust too. Uh, and that, if you shoot yourself in the foot, it doesn't matter what the gun is, right? And so you're arguing guns and feet. It's like, well, I hate to break it to you. If your aim is bad, your aim is bad. You know, I, I don't know what to tell you. So all of this, rush to get things coded, no planning, right? Because what architecture is, it's planning. Uh, that's what you see in society. We're rushing to get things done. We're not planning things out. Uh, there's no reflection, right? When things go bad, we don't go, oh, well, where did this all go horribly wrong? I might go, oh, what, what can I do to fix it? Like, oh, this, this variable, you know, is set to the wrong value. Let's quick do a sprint. It's like, how did you code that to the wrong value to begin with? Is that an architectural problem or just a mistake? Because that matters. Like, let's figure that out first, because maybe we need to skill up this guy. Right. And then let's figure out how we elected this politician that signed this bad bill so we don't do that again. And so the fact that we release all the time now, thank God the cell phone slowed down. It's not. 40 updates a week anymore for two months. Oh. Although it's still updating on it. Oh, what the hell is updating? All you're doing is patching a broken thing over and over and over again. You're never fixing the problem. Those chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs>